Alice Esther here with I Dig Dead People. I have another episode for you, this one about a POW during the Civil War. I was researching a Vivian Collins, and in researching, researching her line, I came across the POW records of one of her ancestors during the Civil War. This ancestor was a prisoner of war in one of the worst Confederate camps uh, during the war, Andersonville Prison. So let's follow the path back from Vivian to her ancestor and learn more about his time during the Civil War. The story begins with Vivian Collins, who was born in 1902 in Franklin County, New York, and her parents were Frank Leslie Collins and Josephine King. At the age of 16, Vivian married Louis Secor, who was 22 years old, and they were married in Chattagay, New York. Chattagay and Franklin County, New York are located in upstate New York, and it's not far from the Canadian border. While Vivian's husband, Louis, was the descendant of immigrant French Canadians, Vivian's ancestry can be traced back to Plymouth, Massachusetts, but that's a story for another time. Louis and Vivian would have 10 children before Vivian's early death on November 4, 1939. At the time of her death, she still had three children under the age of 10. And it's unknown what caused her death. I have not been able to find any uh, death record or obituary. So Vivian's father was Frank Leslie Collins, and he was born June 5, 1876 in New York. And he died December 15, 1924 in Chattagay, Franklin County, New York. Frank was a woodworker, and at times he was employed by the High Falls Pulp and Paper Company in the Chattagay area. By the 1900 U.S. Census, Frank had married Josephine King, and they went on to have eight children. Frank contracted typhoid fever in June of 1924, and six months later he died from the effects of that disease. I was able to learn this um, because there wasn't an actual death record for him, but newspaper. So I would always recommend, if you can, to check old newspaper archives to see if there's an obituary or other information about your ancestor. Um, the paper for the Chateauguay area, it's such a small town, it would list, you know, things like so-and-so was going to visit an aunt in this area. I mean, just the minute details of people's lives. And um, Frank's article was actually one of those. It just talked that um, their neighbor Frank had contracted typhoid fever. And the particular article I found was saying that he was um, recovering from his illness. Unfortunately, about six months later, I found an article that... Um, said that he had actually died from the effects of that typhoid fever. So definitely check out um, newspaper um, archives because they will have a wealth of information about your ancestors. Um, so back to Frank, his parents were Darius and Clorinda Collins. Uh, Darius was born about 1836 to Albert B. and Mariah Collins, and he died June 9, 1886, also in Chattagay, New York. So we have three uh, generations of family living in this small town. It just made it so much easier to be able to trace them back. So all the census records for Darius uh, state that he was born in Canada and that his mother was as well. Since he lived all of his life in Chateauguay and all of his siblings were born in New York and um, his parents lived there, I suspect that uh, with his mother being born in Canada that perhaps the family was visiting some Canadian relatives and he happened to be born at that time during that visit. Uh, it's just a guess. Uh, he did live his life in Franklin County, New York, though. So sometime after the 1860 U.S. Census, Darius married Mariah, and they went on to have five children. Within a couple of years of his marriage, Darius was drafted for the Civil War. And I'm not sure that many people know this, but not everyone volunteered for the Civil War. They were, um, there was a draft put through by the government, and there were actually riots in New York City and other areas uh, people who did not want to serve and be drafted for the Civil War. Uh, but they needed the men in order to fight the war, and so the draft was put through. Uh, Darius was drafted. He, he signed up for the draft. Uh, however, he was never called for service. Um, his, he had two younger brothers, though, Henry and Alfred, and they were not drafted but actually volunteered for service. And they volunteered for service on the same day, on December 2nd, 1863. And then they mustered out that same day. Like they were signed up and out they went. 
Um, they were both assigned to the same company, uh, the 98th Infantry Company B in, of New York State. So Darius's brother Alfred was born in 1838, and he was two years younger than Darius. His record states that he was married at the time of his enlistment, but I have been unable to find any um, marriage record, census record, uh, pension record for you know, his service during the Civil War, anything that lists a wife or any children. So I have been unable, just unable to find anything about this wife. Um, the other brother, Henry Collins, was born in 1846, and he was 10 years younger than the oldest brother, Darius, and only 17 years old when he enlisted. I often wonder what, what brought them to enlist. Was it... Um, you know, did they have a, just a strong conviction of they should fight for their country um, and, you know, end slavery? Or did they need the money and that's why they enlisted? I'm, I'm really not sure. Um, they were farmers, so possibly the money was something that, you know, brought them to enlist. But again, it could also have been just a conviction of what, you know, what was right and that they needed to serve their country and, and end slavery. Um, there's some comfort, you know, in knowing that your brother's with you in battle, you know, Alfred and Henry went together and there's probably comfort with the family as well that, you know, they've got the two of them and, um, hopefully they can keep each other safe. Unfortunately, um, the brother's stories both took a, a dramatic turn and they had very different endings. So we'll start with Alfred. Um, both brothers were part of the second battle that occurred at Drury's Bluff, which is right outside Richmond, Virginia. So when they mustered in on, in December, they were immediately sent out to General Benjamin Butler's army and um, were in Richmond, Virginia fighting just, what, six months later. So they marched to Drury's Bluff on May 9th, and that's where a series of different battles occurred. And then the Confederate Army succeeded in a counterattack on May 16th, and this resulted in the Union losing the overall battle. And it was at this battle that Alfred Collins was captured, six months into his service. And I can only imagine his brother Henry's just horror in returning from the battlefield to realize that his brother wasn't there. And, you know, you've got to be thinking, was he wounded on the battlefield and still laying there? Was he dead on the battlefield and hadn't been picked up yet? Um, or was he a prisoner and now with the Confederate Army? So we do find out uh, that Alfred was sent to the Confederate prison in Andersonville, Georgia at Camp Sumter. I know this because I was able to uh, find his military record and it was all online. Not a, you know, not a lot of pages because it was only six months in service, but um, it did list that he was at the Drury's Bluff battle and that he was captured on May, uh, May 9th. So I was able to do a little more digging on that and find out more about the battle and what happens, you know, to the prisoners and eventually realized in my research that he ended up at the notorious Andersonville prison in Georgia. So this prison was built in early 1864 and it was open for 14 months. It was actually called Camp Sumter. And in that time, 45,000 Union soldiers were imprisoned there. 13,000 of those soldiers died due to overcrowding, lack of nutrition, disease, and exposure to the elements. This camp was only meant to hold 10,000 men, but at one time in August 1864, it held 33,000, three times the number. And I have several photos here of what the prison looked like, photos taken at the time that show how overcrowded this camp was. And this is what it would have looked like when Alfred got there. It would have been this bad, this overcrowded men dying daily from disease, no food, lack of medical care. So due to the deteriorating conditions in the South, most Southerners didn't even have enough food or medical care for themselves or their families, let alone being able to provide any medical care for these Union prisoners. 
and a small stream flowed through this camp. It was called Stockade Branch, and you can see that in one of these photos. This was the only supply of fresh water for the prisoners, and it wasn't fresh. It was contaminated by the sewage of the Confederate officers who lived upstream, and it would flow down through the camp. This was the water they had for drinking, for cooking, for cleaning. So I would definitely recommend if you find that you may have, like, you may have an ancestor that served in some capacity, try to follow up and see if you can get their record. Um, the National Archives can be searched online and um, you can't see the record. You have to, you have to um, ask for, you have to fill out paperwork and pay for the record to be sent to you. But at least you can go on and request it and it does take a little while, a month or two. Um, but when you get the record back, it's amazing what could be in there. Now for Alfred, there was only a little bit um, because he was only in there for six months. But I've done other people like my grandfather who served during Vietnam. And his record came back with like 30 or some pages of the, the things that he had uh, done, where he had been, um, the different medals he had won. I mean, it was just amazing how it filled in a lot of gaps that family doesn't know because they're not with him. They have no idea what he did during the war. And we got like monthly information of where he was being sent and what he did. So it really filled in a lot of gaps that other family members wouldn't know if he didn't tell them and he hadn't. So I highly recommend that if you think you have an ancestor that served, go to the National Archives website, request the record, and see what you can find. I've done it for other um, Confederate soldiers as well and received you know, a few pages of, of their record. So it's just fascinating information that really can fill in a lot of gaps of time for your ancestor and give you a lot of information about what they were doing. So back to Camp Sumter or Andersonville. Whenever you have large numbers of people crowded into a small space without adequate facilities, disease just runs rampant. And this was the case at Camp Sumter. Um, they had measles, smallpox, diphtheria, dysentery, scurvy. Like those are just a few of the things um, that were afflicting the prisoners there. Uh, Alfred probably arrived at Camp Sumter either by train or forced march around early June. And this was the time when the prison was beginning to experience that severe overcrowding with like 10,000 or more men housed there than it was supposed to have. So it was just crazy overcrowded. And Alfred gets there and only survives a month in the filth of Camp Sumter. He died uh, July 9th, 1864 of dysentery. And he was only 23 years old. Um, dysentery is actually a Oh, just a lot of diarrhea, which leaves you um, lacking any kind of liquids and fluids, and so eventually it will kill you. And that's exactly what happened to Alfred. So it's uncertain how long it took for Alfred's family to learn of his death. Um, in July and August of 1865, a few months after the war ended, Clara Barton, and best Clara Barton of the Red Cross, and a former prisoner at Camp Sumter, Dorrance Atwater, they both went to the prison after the war. And Dorrance, who was a former prisoner, he had been tasked by the Confederates to keep a record of the graves of the deceased Union soldiers. So whenever a soldier died, this fellow prisoner was to keep a record of it and write it down. Um, knowing the nature of war, this gentleman feared that his records would be destroyed, and so he actually made his own copy as well so that he could notify Union, the families of Union soldiers after the war. And it was this list that allowed me to find the burial place of Alfred at Andersonville Prison. Um, the record was online, and I was able to see where he was buried and his grave number, what he died from, and that allowed me to um, actually see his grave. I went to visit uh, his grave several years ago and toured the grounds of what's now called Andersonville National Historic Site. And the land has 
it's recovered from the ravages of the Civil War and the placement of that overcrowded camp. Um, there's actually a, they built a stockade there to kind of give you an idea of how big the area was. And um, you can walk in that. It's, it's placed where they believe the prison camp was. But otherwise, a stream doesn't flow through that area anymore. And it's surrounded by green grass and just a very peaceful atmosphere for those that lie there forever. Um, so we know what happened to Alfred, unfortunately, his tragic end. But what happened to his brother Henry, who enlisted with him and uh, was at that same battle? Well, Henry survived the Civil War. He eventually moved to Wisconsin and he married and had children and died on June 18th, 1916 at the age of 71. So we have just these two very different endings for these veterans of the Civil War. Um, the tragic ending, you know, six month uh, military record for Alfred and just dying in horrible, horrible conditions in a prisoner of war camp. And then Henry, who probably fought many more battles during the Civil War before he mustered out and, and survived and went on to have a family. So it's just the trajectory of what your you know, ancestors' lives could look like is just fascinating for two men who went into the same battle in the same unit for the Civil War. So I hope you found this episode interesting. And if you did, please like our page and click the bell so you receive notifications of new episodes that come up. And thank you for watching I Dig Dead People.